Good day, everyone. Today we have a really interesting topic to talk about. First of all, my name is Anastasi and I'm a software engineer. I work in a small cryptographic software company called Cosac Labs. And we create really complex cryptographic solutions, but we want these solutions to be usable for developers. So my job as a product engineer actually to bring a bridge between security people, you know, that weird security people, and usual software developers. And today we will talk about cryptography from unusual angle. How to use it properly from the eyes of people who develop cryptographic tools. And surprisingly, it's easier than you might think. First of all, first of all, let's imagine that you are a software developer, a cat. And you're like, okay, we have some user data and we want to protect it. From another perspective, there are we. Security developers, security engineers. And we are like, hey, I'm a security engineer and I try to make security products and I want developers to use it. So the question is, with two lonely cats, when they come together and they ask, okay, how to achieve this? Let's imagine a typical scenario. We have some product, some infrastructure, and we have a user-sensitive data there. And the question is, how to protect this data? I know that you are using like Java, PHP, um, C++, JavaScript? Anyone? Good. Oh, yes, sorry. Sure. Can you please raise your hand who actually makes technical solutions in your product? Who is like software architect, tech lead, CTO? Well, some people are. Because usually when we're talking about security, it's not just a feature we can put in our product on the last sprint. It's something we should, we should start from, right? So right now I want to outline a typical approach how to solve this problem. We have sensitive data, we want to protect it from usual developer uh, point of view and outline some mistakes me and my colleagues were doing trying to solve this problem. The first question is how to define a data scope. What data do we have? What data do we consider as sensitive? Does our solution, does our opinion about sensitive data is compliant to existing regulations? like GDPR, HIPAA, PCI, DSS. What about idea that we are okay in defining business-related data, but we still usually uh, collect another types of data, like, uh, you know, logs, like geotags, some technical data, we don't, uh, we don't always think about it. These data pieces may be outside of our attention span. And first mistake software developers usually do when they try to protect sensitive data is the wrong definition of data scope. They just miss some pieces they should protect. How to fix this mistake? Well, that's easy. You need to understand what data flow is, uh, what is your risk model, what is your threat model? And how do you comply to existing regulations, right? Next, let's imagine that we are good in defining data scope. Now we, let's imagine that we want to store this data encrypted. And the question is, which encryption algorithm we should use? Can you tell me? Really? Of those, can you tell me which algorithm you would use? Oh, okay. It's not. It's not funny. Yes, of course, none of them, because uh, some of them are encryption algorithms, some of them are hash algorithms. But the idea is that they are old. They are outdated. You should not use them. So the second mistake we usually make: we have good intents, but we select bad encryption algorithms. 
how to fix this mistake. It's not so easy, unfortunately. You, need, uh, you don't need to use outdated libraries, and you should keep an eye on, well, keep an eye on progress and be synced with the progress, right? So, when we are trying to solve this easy problem, let's protect user data, and we did only two steps. Define data scope and selecting encryption algorithm. We already have several things to decide on. And we are not finished yet. Next question is, we have selected some encryption algorithm and now we are ready to use it. How? We start digging into existing libraries, we start checking check overflow, and this is a, some code from Stack Overflow, if, if I remember correctly. What do we see here? We see tons of parameters. We see things like buffer, buffer lengths, key, key lengths, init vector, padding, and so on, so on, so on. Do you, take a look on this thing. How do you think why they put IS 256 CBC there? Do you know what is CBC? Yeah, it's uh, one of the modes for block cipher. The thing is that it's really outdated one. So third mistake you can make, even if you have selected right crypto algorithm and you're trying to use it, you put wrong params. You can use outdated block cipher mode. You can uh, make mistakes in padding because if you don't use correct padding, you can, it can lead to Oracle padding attack. You can use init vector the same again and again and again. We did only three steps. But the amount of things we should decide on just to protect our data is continuing to grow. And we are not finished yet. OK, next. Encryption means using a key. What is a good key? Of course, it should not be the same as a user password. Of course, we have a problem how to generate a key. What key derivation function to use? Um, how to store the key? How to transfer the key? Should we think about key revocation? Should we think about how to manage these old keys? You know, what to do if we know that the key is compromised? What to do to understand if the key is compromised? Do, have, do we have these key management mechanisms? You know this, uh, this idea that encryption is easy, but key management is hard. So if you are good in defining data scope, if you are good in selecting algorithm, if you are good in providing right params and bad in key management, well, your security probably is not the best one. And again, we just want to protect user data, but the amount of things we should make decision on just continues to grow. And of course, modern applications, it's not just a single app. It's a huge infrastructure based on different uh, architectures, based in running in different operating systems. And of course, it, it's based on components, and these components, they're talking together to each other via some secure channel. And again, we have a lot of keys. In all this infrastructure, we have lots and lots of keys. And if you think about it, if, th if you think about how to implement backups, what is our backup key? How to store all these keys for all our components? This amount of things we should decide on when we are just trying to protect the user data continues to grow. Don't you feel a little bit overwhelmed? Let me show you something. This paper was published a year ago, and the guys have analyzed near 300 vulnerabilities and divided them into two sources, into two groups based on source that cause vulnerability. So the first group is 
vulnerability caused by bugs inside crypto libraries. And the second group is vulnerabilities caused by misusing crypto libraries. Can you guess the numbers? Let's try. Let's try to guess the numbers. How many uh, percent of vulnerabilities was caused by bugs inside crypto libraries? What are your suggestions? Example. Sorry? Example. <laughs> uh, just tell me a number. 5%. 5%. 10%. 1%. Four. Zero. Any other suggestions? Well, 17% of mistakes are caused by crypto libraries, but most of them, majority of them, are caused by misusing crypto libraries by usual application developers. These mistakes are caused by, you know, our hands. And if we don't want to be part of these statistics, we need to use encryption carefully. If we are developers, we are users of cryptography, what do we want? Do we want more ciphers? Imagine a world where we can have a cipher for each problem, for each, each use case we use even more ciphers. It sounds rather exciting, right? More ciphers, more things to work with, more protocols, more possible attacks, more vulnerabilities, more security patches. Really cool. Yeah, it's exciting, but I'm looking into your eyes. It, you don't think it's exciting. Maybe it's exciting, but for crypto researchers only, for security analysts only. Not for the developers, right? Yes, yes. So as developers, as users, I am so happy that you are talking with me. So as for developers, as users, we want something that is called boring crypto. Boring crypto is a concept proposed by Daniel Bernstein. Boring crypto is the idea that there is somewhere in the world a cryptography that just simply works, that is strong enough to resist all possible current attacks and will be strong enough to resist all future attacks. It doesn't need any updates. More encrypted is super easy, just plug and play. You turn it, you turn it on, and you are using it, it's working. So most of you are not interested in parameters of encryption schemes in key lengths, in paddings, probably instead of selecting cryptography based on your knowledge, you just want to solve your use case. You just want cryptography that is, has high level functions like, I want to store data securely. I want to send data securely. I want to verify the data is from trusted source. Of course, this high-level functions is hiding a whole properly, a whole properly composed crypto primitives inside with the correct parameter, with correct keys, with correct paddings. But I believe that engineers doesn't, don't need to spend time on uh, understanding cryptography. Engineers need something that they will use to solve their problems easily and correctly. And of course, even with best, with best encryption algorithms, uh, there, are, there are some of them, there are a lot of libraries, but there is a problem that they have a lot of documentation and they know nobody is reading docs. I mean, like, raise your hands who likes reading docs. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> when I'm writing docs, I like to read them too. But um, it's necessary for developers, it's necessary to understand what's happening just looking on the functions. It's necessary to, well, usually me as a developer, I just want to, to have an example. I just want to have an example app, I just want to run it and to make sure, yes, it's working. I don't want to dig into long encryption documentation. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's take a look uh, at the very beginning, how to install a crypto library. This is an example of how to build 
and run boring SSL for iOS. You need only one command and you will get the compiled library and you will get the example project you can try and you can play with. How do you think how it looks for Android? This is just the first comment. For Android, you need to compile Boring SSL separately for each architecture. Then you need to have these compiled binaries and put them together in a fat binary. And then you should make up your own example project. And it's just a first command you run into if you want to use Boring SSL on Android. We need something else. Uh, we should not be scared, like you now, on a doorway. We want easy installation first. Then, we, we, uh, we expect that there is no uni-platforms product anymore. We have a lot of operating system, we have a lot of architectures, we have a lot of chipsets to run our products on. We want cryptography solutions, cryptography products to work on all these architectures. It's not a question on comf of comfort anymore. It's a question of must-have. We expect it by default. We need consistent, easy cross-platform availability. What options do we have? Let's go to the practical world. Let's um, think about different security solutions based on paranoia levels. And we will start from the most paranoid one. Do you know what is it? Faraday cage, yes. So in the most paranoid case, you have a dump device that doesn't have really a lot of connections to the, real, to the world, and maybe it's inside a Faraday cage. Is it useful? Uh, well, in our usual... In our usual world, maybe it's not the most useful solution. But from security perspective, from perspective of security people, it's kind of a super cool solution, you know. Let's get real. Uh, hardware. Ultimate security for encryption products are HSMs, hardware security models. Uh, you can separate computation environment and secure key storage and minimal change, changes of leakage if you, you will get these things if you do things right. HSMs are used in banks, in ATMs, in large SIA data centers. Probably, have, have you worked with HSMs before? Well, I know, yes, two of them. But most for most software products, you probably won't use it. Next, TPMs. TPM's trusted platform model. It's a bit lower grade of security. It gets integrated into your device and it exposes in some internals, so it can be misused. It's a trust anchor if you trust the vendor. Sometimes TPM's involves remote attestation of the code that is running on the machine. What's the benefits of using HSMs and TPM's? Separation of duties and compartmentalizations are core security principles that minimizes the risks. Or saying more simple, running crypto in isolated environment and storing keys in isolated trusted environment is like super secure. What are problems of using hardware cryptography? It's bloody expensive. It's a vendor lock, it's, you should trust vendor, and you need these devices for every point you do crypto on. It's not easy to maintain, it's not easy to debug without vendors engineers. And if you're not a bank, you might be challenged. Moreover, HSM's uh, cryptography that is running on HSM's, it's quite far from your application. So your data, your plain text data, is transmitting in between your app and HSM. And this not always suits to your architecture. And sometimes you need to redesign it a bit. So let's lower the paranoia level. And we go to software cryptography. 
which is probably you know you, you, you know you used before, right? Software cryptography is flexible, it works for your languages, and well, it's available for most of ecosystems. But there is no way to trust device that executed the code. And for some infrastructures, like based on mobile environments, it's okay. Because mobile are known to have some kind of safe execution environment. But again, if you use iPhone, it means you trust Apple. For some platforms, like web browsers, there is literally no way to figure out what code you are running and if it's really safe. No matter how good the actual implementation is, browsers itself are known to be not a reliable environment. However, there are a lot of people who are working to fix this, right? We are just not there yet. Typically, for your products, you are, comp you are combining the best of two worlds. You use hardware, crypto, where you can. You try to move all you know, uh, critical computations on the hardware level and to store keys there. And you use software, crypto, uh, to generate user keys, uh, to be able to communicate with your applications. So if you don't have trust to the key stored in the environment, you can encrypt your encryption keys using the user keys and don't store user keys. User keys is some, something that is stored outside device. It starts in our brains, right? It's our passwords. I think you don't like this theory. Let's talk more practical. So, um, summarizing, summarizing things we outlined before. What do we want from crypto? We want it to be easy to install. Easy to use, multi-platform, open, audited, stable, reliable, and so on and so on. But what is more important, it's a form factor. There are three form factors for software cryptography. First, uh, first is a boxed solutions. That the solutions are completely solving your use case. Then. Uh, crypto systems. Crypto systems uh, implement some security guarantees required by your use case. And the crypto libraries, that are a set of primitives that you need to assembly and to build into your product. Based on my experience of using cryptography a lot before, I want to stay away of implementing encryption myself as long as I can. These stairs, when you start uh, to solve your use case, you are like on the stairs. And first of all, you will try to find a box solution. If there is nothing, go step down, and you try to find the existing crypto system. If there is nothing, more step down to crypto libraries. Each step will require a lot of uh, more effort and more knowledge. By the way, have you seen do you see the block? Let's implement crypto algorithms ourselves. No, because there is no one here. Please don't implement uh, crypto algorithm yourself. Don't roll your own crypto, okay? Let's discuss these things one by one. Crypto libraries. They implement some kind of security functions, like encrypt, decrypt the data, sign, verify, and there are plenty of libraries you can check by the link. You can check by the link which libraries are common for your platforms. But it's, usually it's not a boring crypto. These are some examples. Noise protocol. It's a framework for building encrypted communication protocols. Lipsodium. Have you heard about Lipsodium? Well, okay. Do you know some of them? Which one? Uh, Lipsodium. Yeah, it's a part of NHCL. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. N-A-C-L. Like, you know, nat sodium what? Sodium uh, natri chloride, kind of. I'm not into chemistry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lipsodium is a part of another 
a super popular library and ACL, which this part works um, basically on many platforms. Themis is open source library uh, for secure storage and secure data transfer. And Kitsar is a Google implementation of key generation, key storage, and like cryptography and key management. This is an example. Not of these libraries are known as boring crypto. Not of them are easy to use. This is an example of Themis that enables transport encryption using ephemeral keys. It's quite easy to use. All you need to do is to start a secure session, to wait until it's established, and to send data. That's all. Good libraries, there. Um, the advantage of using good libraries is that you can run them really quickly and easy. Then, <clears throat> crypto systems. Crypto systems combine security functions for solving exact use cases with maximum guarantees. I'm sure you still know some of them, like SSL TLS. It's a crypto system. Um, well, you know where you use it. Then, Axolotl, uh, you see, Axolotl, it's a protocol for multi-user communication that is used in Signal, I believe, right? Who is security expert here? Oh, that's me. I will Google it. Uh, Hermes, it's a library, it's a framework that is used to provide data control on, on encrypted data with granular access based on encrypted cryptographic keys. Zero Kids solves nearly the same. So they both solve the problem how to collaborate on data securely when it's not about messaging, but it's all about sharing a lot of data with granular access. This is an example of using Hermes. One command to implement functionality of crypto stable ACL when you actually uh, when you actually create an encrypted document and provide read access to user one. Super easy. But not all these libraries are super easy. Box solutions. Box solutions, as I said before, is an idea is an idea when you can find a solution for all your entire use case. It's super easy for you to use it. The problem is that there are not so many box solutions and probably not of all of your use cases are good to work with these solutions. Do you know which one you use really quite frequently? It's SSH. SSH. This is a box solutions, box solution based on crypto system. Among others, you can see Accra. It's a database encryption proxy. Vault, I think you know what Vault is. Key management, key storing solution. And TrueCrypt, which is used for managing containers. Hey people, do you know one of them? At least one of them? Okay. Because I have a feeling that, you know, I'm showing you some weird stuff you haven't seen before. Just tell me, yes, yes, we know the things. Yes, yes, we know the things. Okay, let's look at an example. Mm. This one command that is used to launch database encryption proxy, it actually launches the database. I think it's PostgreSQL database in this case. It launches the encryption proxy itself. It made a key generation. It makes a key generation. It puts keys to the correct folders to all these components and enables SSL connection between them. One command, and you will have fully useful, ready-to-use infrastructure. This is a good example of boring crypto library. So, if you have a security problem you want to solve, first step you want to do is to find a box solutions. There are some of them. You can use some of them. 
The problem is that, well, your use case may be too complicated or you may just not find the right solution for you. Next, you do this step down and start looking for crypto systems. Crypto systems are still okay. It doesn't solve everything you need, but it solves a large piece of problem you need to solve. And if there is no success, only in this case, you should start looking for a library. Which library to use? And as I said before, each step on the stairs requires a lot of more, a lot more efforts to use, a lot more knowledge to have to be able to uh, set up and configure this solution properly. For example, this picture is a scheme, is a map, how to select crypto library if you work on iOS application depending on your needs. It might be a little bit complicated, right? There is a link where you can find it in a, um, as a large image. You don't want to do this kind of choices. You want to avoid it as long as possible. Yes, yes, we don't want. Give us a solution. Give us things that works. OK, OK, people, I'm working on it, OK? It's not ready yet. We live in a cruel world. Actually, we and worlds around us, we don't have any problems with new crypto algorithms. We don't have any problems with, you know, um, having a crypto algorithm for each our use case. But we understand that algorithms themselves, that's not a problem. The problem is that they are really complicated to use. And using them means a lot of effort and time. And using them means you may be into that statistics. As people who misuse crypto libraries and have a vulnerability in your app. Do you remember what is it? Do you know what is it on the picture? What is it? Yeah. Gas lamp. Yeah, it's oil lamp. Have, have you ever used oil lamp? Like, in your, have you seen this kind of thing in your like grandpa, grandma house? Yeah? Previously, people used oil lamp uh, really often. They did devices and like there are different kinds of oil lamp, so maybe you don't recognize this one exactly, because in different regions people use different kind of oil lamps, and they use different kinds of oil, and you also need to have this, you know, this thread, the wick that you put into, and it was super complicated. If you want to to turn on the light in the evening. You need to go through all of your oil lamps and to light them. And of course, you need to buy all these supplies. Do you know why Edison lamp becomes so popular? Still, sorry? Good marketing. Good marketing. Yeah, still you need to buy these lamp bulbs. Right? Still you need to find the supplies. But what was the greatest Edison invention? The light switch. Edison made the light controllable. Now it's easy to turn it off and turn it on when you need it. It's easy to find supplies. OK, OK, it's, it's important questions. What common does Edison lamp and modern cryptography have? Boring. Boring, right. We want the same from modern cryptography. We want the same from tools and libraries. We want them to be, uh, to use them like, we want them to be controllable. We want them to be predictable. We want them to be easy to use. We want them to be boring. You spoiled my super slide. Huh? Yeah, sure, sure. Just joking. So we want the same for, from the cryptography. 
We don't want to dig into crypto algorithms. We don't want to understand what parameters are there, which block cipher mode to use, what to use as a padding. We just want it to turn off on, turn on and it's working, turn off and it doesn't working, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I see your faces. I, I think we should wrap up. Take a look at this unicorn. Take a look, take a look, relax. Cryptography is not scary. Cryptography is not complicated. Uh, what we do, what we did today, we looked on the problem, how to protect the data. And we analyzed how many steps we need to do and how many mistakes we can do when we are deciding which algorithm, what is the data, how to define the data scope, what algorithm to use, what parameters to use, how to manage keys, what to do if we have more than a single app but the whole infrastructure based on keys. We look on the possible solutions uh, like, you know, sorted by level of paranoia. Starting from pa Faraday cage, which obviously is not really useful, to hardware encryption schemes, like using HSMs and TPMs, to software encryption, to browser encryption. We commonly use a lot of software encryption, so there are different form factors how to use it. We can find a box solution and then we're like, hey, we can solve it easily. We can find a crypto system, and then we're like, okay, we can solve some things from our use case easily. Or we need to select which crypto library to use, and if we are lucky enough, this library is easy to use. If we are not lucky enough, uh, and the main narrative, the main idea, the main key takeaway I want you to know when you will left this room that as developers and as crypto engineers, we want cryptography to be controllable, to be easy, to be like an Edison lamp in the world of light. I know that you like reading a lot about cryptography, right? Yes. Especially in spring when everything is so green and the sun is shining, the reading nice security book. Mm -hmm. So I prepared a list of articles for you to expand your horizon. And of course, it's only three of them. It's not enough, obviously. So there is another page. Maybe you like reading them. Actually, there are a lot of useful things. And now, I think you're a little bit overwhelmed, but you can ask me any questions like in a, in a hall, in a hall, right? So thank you for your attention. <laughs>